Hello everyone, my name is Cindy McDonald and I'm an instructor for the UCLA College Counseling Certificate Program. It is my honor and privilege to be able to interview interesting people from around the world on topics that we um, work with our students and that we deal with every day. And I'm so honored and pleased to have with you one of my former students, Gabriela. And Gabriela Sanchez is um, a counselor and an advisor out of school in Mexico City. So Gabriela, we're so glad to have you here. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you. Very excited to be here and very, very honored to be so tell us a little bit about your school um, and, and what makes it unique. Okay, so I work at the American School Foundation of Monterrey, which is located in Monterrey in the north part of Mexico. It's an international school. It's an N through 12 um, school. And um, it was what it makes it unique, I think it's a very, because it's a school that I think right now has 95 years. I was an, an alumni, so I studied there. And I think it's, it has a lot of students that uh, value from a high quality education and really take, so take a stand for their education really seriously and, and try to go take it for themselves and then go beyond the classroom to make those very cool things. <laughs> that is, that, it's exciting to have that tradition, that, that long legacy, and yet still be agile enough to, to explore and do things and be contemporary in terms of what the students and the family needs are. Uh, what city is the your school in? In Monterrey, Mexico. So it's in the state of Nuevo León. It's about a two hour drive to the Texan border. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, so that puts you in a pretty central location for, for um, working with, you know, as a location for the school. Tell us about your role with the students. So currently I'm the community engagement coordinator. For the past two years, I've been working on restructuring the community outreach program. Our high school students are required to do 100 service hours for graduation. So um, for these past two years, I've been um, working, creating liaisons with different local NGOs for students to engage in volunteer programs. And I've also worked closely with all the students that lead these programs. Some of them are NGO led, like for example, in the food bank, we just, they tell us what to do and we do it. Um, but there's also a lot of student led programs, whether with orphanages or with local neighboring elementary schools that students design the programs. So I work closely with them to ensure, A, we achieve that desired impact and to, um, to ensure it's a very meaningful experience for the volunteer for their personal growth and development. I think that's a really key thing. When you're working with students and when we all work with adolescents, sometimes they're just doing it to get the hours, right? Like, I gotta get this on, I've gotta have this, I don't care, I'll go, you know, do um, the Humane Society and work with the animals, I love with the, the animals, but they're not always looking to get that personal growth um, from that. So what is this a position that you walked into or did you develop it and and make it evolve into what the needs were for you and the students? So before this role, I was a teacher for the community, you know, for the character education program in high school. It's, the, it, it's a program that went from sixth grade all the way to 11th grade. And it culminate the 11th grade course, which was the last one, culminated with a service-based action project. Um, and what I noticed as a teacher is the A, the program gave them only one month to create this action project. So again, similar to, to a lot of community service programs, was students engaged in the project just for the grade and passing the class. So it really lacked a, like meaning for purpose and um and like tackling actually a, a local issue. So um, I worked with my colleagues and we started integrating the design thinking process as the, to the class and we decided to immerse them into um, the community. So we chose the sustainable development goal of quality education um, and we started taking them to the neighboring local elementary schools. And in Mexico, different to the United States, um, 
bueno, the public schools depend on federal government, like the federal government, the funding and the administration and everything. And then we have private schools that even though are aligned and with the public um, is the education system, because we, the pub, private schools get their own funds, pay tuition in Mexico, public education is free. Um, so there is a, a big distinction between the two types of educations you receive. So as we tackled it, we took them to, well, first we researched like the issue online and everything. And then we took them to the schools. They made observations. Um, they interviewed the principals. And it was actually a very eye-opening experience for them. Um, I think they were very impressed with a signif like the significant differences, just a five-minute drive away. Mm -hmm. And I think these, what we didn't, well, A, the experience triggered triggered a lot of emotions, a lot of curiosity. Um, we, I include myself, learned that literally the government gives these schools only teacher salaries and funds to pay basic utilities of water and electricity. So if they wanted paper, toilet paper, air conditioning, fix, fix a leak, there was literally no funds. So it was very impressive just to listen to it and, and start understanding um, all the problems involved in it. So with this class, we integrated the design thinking process. And after analyzing the whole situation, they identified problems, whether it was lack of access to technology or just scarcity of materials, whether it was cleaning materials and toilet paper or math manipulatives. And then they came up with a solution and in groups, most of them required funding. So they did fundraisers. Este, and it was, it was a very powerful class. They were, A, it was very dynamic. It was very student led. It was messy at the teacher. Sometimes you had something planned, but everything changes because it was very real time. Um, but they were able to achieve like big projects. I mean, they painted schools, they uh, donated um, projectors and screens and furniture and books. So it was very empowering for them. Um, for me as a teacher, I think as well. And I think from this, the opening came for the community service or the community service program or outreach program. And then was I entered into that role. And I think from learning for seven years teaching this course, is that I did notice a lot of students were just doing it for, for the hours, just check them off. And I think one of my goals was to ensure that whatever experience or whatever program students engaged in, they were able to, to develop because that social awareness and also that self-awareness. I mean, in class also, I mean, you we had to make calls, you know, Gen Z students, DM, everything. So it's like, me, they're not under, they're not answering. And I'm like, okay, call them. People, how? Yo, because you dial the number, you know, and like, hello, this is whoever, and we're doing this. But there was a lot of modeling and scaffolding, yes. but then there was a lot of, again, self-confidence and and students got empowered, like, me, they said yes, or... I finally was able to make the call. And so it's, I think what was very enriching for me was, was seeing como the, the, the growth in my students more than the impact in the community. Well, and I think that's an important aspect. And I think that's something that students don't realize parents often have that as a goal for their children or, or in an educational you know, class or setting. You, you know that they're going to grow just as much from the experience and the project or thing that they're doing is just kind of the added benefit, kind of them seeing the fruits of their labors, but it, it becomes a win-win. So, so share some examples. What are some examples of passion project? Do you call it passion projects or do you call it something else? What do you, what do you, what's the term that you use with your students? Well, for, for the grade 11 course in particular, it was just an action project. Okay. Um, again, I think, and, and, you, and you mentioned it right now, so my takeaway from teaching this class is we were, our objective was character education, so it was character development. And I think one of my biggest takeaways was that it, students required real life experience to actually develop character and, and particularly their self-awareness and their um, social awareness. And I think when we talk about passion projects, there was another class in grade 10 that we taught 
um, that was focused on decision making and risky behavior. So we focused a lot on drugs and alcohol and sex. And after doing some research, um, what we learned was that when a student has a strong sense of identity, they they can actually come up withstand or or este, these risky behaviors and because they have a clear set like clear sense of, of direction. So for the grade 10 class, um, what we started doing was we shifted the focus from preventing certain behaviors to actually promoting positive behaviors. Oh. And what we, did, what we did there, and well, I called it the Element Project based on Ken Robinson's book, The Element. Um, what we did was we, we supported students in exploring their values, their skill sets, their interests, and similar to the grade 11, it, the class culminated in an action project. And it's like a passion project where based on what they discovered about themselves, um, they took action. So we took advantage of the need for the grade. And it's like, in order uh -huh. for you to class this class, you need to take action. And I think that really helped me because there's a lot of hesitation from students and even ad as adults, like just jumping onto the unknown and having that courage to take action. Mm -hmm. um, and and then again, at the end of the day, and I always told the students, it's not about finding como, your lifelong project forever, but it's just do a project, see where it goes, and let's see what you learn about it. So so I think there, in, in the grade 10 class, which was more focused on the self-awareness piece, we did passion projects. So how do the students find what projects? So it sounds like you're tying them to their value, their their skills, you know, some of the things as, but you have to dig deep. The students have to dig deep to get there. So, so how do you help them dig deep and how do they use that then to find what they want to work on? So one of the frameworks that I found really useful was the Ikigai. From the Japan, like this Japanese technique of finding purpose, is that they they have a Venn diagram where they merge like what you're good at, what what you what you love, and then what you can get paid for and what the world needs, and and they say at the very center when you find all those four, you sort of find come of this meaningful work or meaningful project. So the way we help students um, is we turned it into an algebraic formula, like passion project equals your interest, like an interest of yours, plus a skill set, plus a need in the world, whether it's like more of a social issue or whether it's something you can get paid for. Um, and what we did is we helped students brainstorm their interests and skills. Um, one of the tools that I, that I found very useful was the self-discovering exercises that are presented in the book, What Color Is Your Parachute for Teens? So it has a lot of questions and that really supports teens, teens actually like delve deep into who they are. Mm -hmm. And we use those, use those and they came up and I always tell them uh, like creativity, it's all about the quantity. So try to write as much interest that you have and as much skill sets that you have. And for needs in the world, I do feel, or I, I did see that some of them struggle. Like if they learn something about immigrants in English class, they might write that. So if they've had exposure to certain social issues, they might write them down. But if students have never had that exposure, it's difficult for them to fill out some of that third variable. But then once they have this list, we start playing around with the variables. So let's say um, you like to play the piano and you're good at tutoring, I suppose maybe you could start teaching pianos. So we started playing around, um, trying to, to merge all these variables to come up with a list of potential passion projects. And then once they have that list, because they start narrowing it down to see which one's more viable, and then we just push them <laughs> into taking action. <laughs> and again, that's helpful because it's in a class, like, well, I know I have to do this, and so um i'm i'm going to move forward and and you're there to support them through that you know overcoming any of their self-limiting behaviors i'm afraid to call on the phone or talk to somebody i don't know or reach out and that sounds like that's where your connections with the community and things can really help the students to be able to take that big step yes 
Like, and, and you asked earlier about an example. For example, in this class, we had a student, and, and I used her example, in that one of her interests was playing piano. And part of her skill set was tutoring because she tutored some of her peers, I don't know, for math or socials. And because of my interactions with the schools, I learned that the government had given them several instruments about three years back, but because they didn't have any music teachers, those instruments were boxed for three years. So I shared with the student, I said, so so as we were coming up with potential, um, uh, potential projects, I told her, well, I heard about this. We could merge this interest and skill set, and maybe you can go to the schools and and teach music. So she bought it. She invited a friend that that played the guitar because there were also guitars in that in that in those boxes and a violin player. And that was tenth grade. So that was spring semester of tenth grade. They started going on Saturday mornings to teach their 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 music classes. And then in June, like by the end of June, July, they they created a, a small music recital for the oh, students wow. and the parents. That was super magical. Like it's very empowering to see more than the response of the children. I think just having the parents there very excited, you know, recording their child. It's very powerful to see those come of that ripple effect in the community. And then this, in ele when they went into 11th grade, I actually got into the community outreach program and I told them, why don't we scale it to the other schools? So then for their 11th and 12th grade, they they, they scaled it to four schools. Chain, I think they ended up with about, like this last year, I think they had about 25 students and 15 volunteers in the program. Wow. And, yes, it was very exciting. Um, so that's that's one. We play around and then I think as an adult, sometimes because we just have more connections in the community, we can help them um, merge or but place their project somewhere where it will have more, more probability for success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So what are the, the expected outcomes from the projects, the things that they're working on? What are you helping, hoping the students achieve through this? Well, I think me personally, I think my, my, my biggest, like my desired outcome is just this growth, this expand expansion of, of who they are and empowering them to know that they can actually have a meaningful contribution in their community. And I guess a way of sense of belonging in their community. Um, and I think you know, my belief, my personal belief is that every student has a hidden potential. Some of, some of them have it more out there than others, but I think I think our role as adults, whether parents or advisors or teachers, is trying to find that potential in the students and making them realize that that potential is very valuable in the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And have you found any unexpected outcomes from the students doing these, you know, finding their um, areas and and doing this outreach and these projects. What are some unexpected outcomes that you've seen? For for myself, like unexpected outcomes, I think one of the biggest out, unexpected outcomes I didn't foresee as as the adult sort of as the overseeing everything was when we were working with the schools. Again, unfortunately, our government because <laughs> we don't know where the funds go, <laughs> but. It, definitely doesn't go to education. And we we went to schools that were run down in maintenance. You would see the paint like really faded and you could even see it cracking from the different layers. Um, so when we started working with the schools and we started Im improving that learning environment, just painting the facade or, or the classrooms, and, and I think just going there and listening to them. And, and then you, there were students that popped up after the class saying, Miss, I want to continue. And, and I got this printer because I didn't have a printer. And I think my that for me, the biggest unexpected outcome was when a teacher told me, you gave me hope. Like oh, we wow. we literally, yeah, como que we, we lost hope. We were just operating for the operation. And as we started seeing this trans post physical transformation and very simple because it was just paint, you know, or a few books, or that printer here and there. 
But she told me, you gave me and my teachers hope and, and just the attitude of my teacher changed. So that for me was an unexpected outcome. But I think for students, I think the expected outcome for students is just like, ah, we're painting the school and the expected outcome is the school's gonna be painted or I'm gonna be teaching piano and the, the student is going to be learning piano. Like that's how much they can see. Right. And, and I think the unexpected outcomes for students are for particularly when working with people like the social impacts, just that empowering of the students or, or what the parents say, or just seeing the parents show up to the music recital that you created. It's, it's just for them. I think it's sort of magical because it's, it's so unexpected and it's so like, I, I don't have a word for it, but it's like surreal. Like I'm, it's like I'm important and people are responding. So, so I think kids don't, don't, I don't know if it's their cognitive development, but they just can't see far beyond. Right. Right. And, and they don't, so often they are their own worst critics, right? You know, they don't see the, the talents and the gifts and the things that they can bring. And so how empowering that is to realize I started here. I didn't know what I was doing. I ended up here and I've empowered all these people and this is all um, taken place. What can I do next? I just see it so empowering, not only for the students, as you said, the parents, for your community, um, you know, and for you as a teacher and as a school. So as an, as an advisor working with students on this, uh, I know of other people who are gonna be listening to this and go, that is so cool. How can I do that? What would you tell them? How can, how can they implement something like this, you know, within their school or their own programs? So I think the first one is, um, I would start early, like just passion projects, you know, going back and, and going back to, to the course of college counseling. What I have noticed is that there's a lot of juniors in the spring semester or a lot of seniors in their fall semester that get, I need a project. And it's like, <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> so I can't even guarantee the impact you can write and share, whether it's in your extracurricular list or, or whether it's in your essay. So I think my first recommendation would be start early. Mm -hmm. um, you can start early. I've worked with ninth graders, 10th graders. I'm sort of exploring working with middle school students. And I do think um, there's a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's starting early. And I think with middle school students and early, like uh, young high school students, I think one of the biggest um, things you can recommend to them is just engage in the community. So whether it's in volunteer programs or student groups or youth groups or church groups, but try to get involved in outside of, of school and outside of your home. And I think that helps them also network, uh, find themselves, their strengths, their interests, um, and also let them explore. Like, like I tell my students, like at the end of the day, I didn't like it. Okay, good. There's out of the big list of possibilities, there's one list. So it, it helps you narrow over that sense of direction. So I think that would be my, my first recommendation for the little ones. If you want to work directly with, with students in creating passion projects, I think it's number one, um, guiding them in this um, process of self exploration, like I I would I wouldn't mention like college applications, awards, because those are consequential outcomes. So you would be surprised um, yeah. of 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 because what again? Because that's what at, at the end of the day colleges are looking for. And it's just come up presenting this genuine project. So if you really focus on like we want to discover who you are and, and we want to help you become the person you want to be. Um, I would explore, um, help them explore the interests and skill sets, like help them identify them. Um, we also worked, again, as we redesigned the full program, we also worked on, on exploring self-limiting beliefs, whether it's social norms, um, whether it's parents' expectations or societal expectations, but again, teaching them like was which ones are 
real or which ones are just like part of our imagination. Um, so I think that piece also too is identifying those self-limiting beliefs. Um, there's this TED talk that's called Fear Setting. Um, and, and we turned it into sort of a worksheet and, and it's this what if statement. So what if, if I write a book and then it, it it goes through the process. So if you watch the TED talk, it says like, okay, think of all the potential like things that can go wrong and then think of ways to prevent them or to repair them. And, but it also helps you see the costs of not taking action. So, so it really motivates them then mm -hmm. to jump. So we we use that 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 structured tool, um, and I think just playing around um, with with again like sort of post its or or like variables and and their interests and their needs, I think in guiding them and making those connections. Like I had one student that was very interested in 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 working with food waste, mm -hmm. and he, like a teacher said, I'm sending you a student. He's really interested in doing something about food waste. Um, see how you can help him. And that was super outside of my comfort zone and my knowledge. So he came in and I said, well, step one, let's research what's happening like locally. And then um, I had a family friend who was involved in government creating some of, of the laws for food waste. So, so I said, well, I'm going to contact you with him, go interview him and see um, from your research, like what questions do you have and, and et cetera. So he went and interviewed there. Then that person sent him to the president of our local food bank and, and it's Caritas. I think it's an international organization, but it's in Me this sec section is Caritas no, Zero Hunger. So they, they managed the food bank, but they had uh, other initiatives on, on, on managing food waste. So then he went with him, had an interview. And then um, from there, he started the volunteer program at our local food bank and he's actually right now uh talking with with the president of, of this ngo to see in what ways they can some they have an app where they contact or they they connect restaurants and organizations so we're now going to the second level but this has taken again one year and a half so again if you want to do this in spring spring semester of junior year so by october or november you have early decisions you don't have that experience. I think that is the key thing. If you and it and it goes back to the motivation and the reason for doing the project. Um, if it's just add something to your resume, your application, then you're already missing the boat. But starting early, one of the other classes that I teach for UCLA is finalizing the college admissions process. But my whole, with my students, it's always the very first step has always been self-exploration. How can you figure out where you're going or what you're gonna do if you don't know enough about yourself? And it's not what mom and dad say, it's not what your peers say, you know, exploring, you know, your true um, values and, and what your interests are. And you, that's a process. And so that has to start with, that's why I start with students as early as eighth grade for those reasons. And I worked in a program here in the US called AVID. And we were also, that was a big part of it. And you have so much more success. What a much more meaningful experience that your students have had, Gabby, because they have started, they tied it to their interests, and then they get to see those outcomes. So I just, I think that's great wise advice. They don't have to spend tons of money. You know, now you see all these people starting these passion projects, going to these research, you know, and they're paying lots of money to have a PhD student, you know, help them and then publish it. And, and I know that's all good and fine, but I would much rather have students do what you're having students do. It just seems much more impactful. Um, and have the students come out like you, you sounds like you've been doing this for a long time. What are some of the outcomes that you've seen even once they graduated from high school or gone on to higher education? Have they come back and pursued some of those things? What have you seen them do? Well, I, I think my first 
like my first generation graduated about two or three years ago. Okay. Um, so, so I don't, I haven't seen much of them. A lot of them go study abroad. Um, but I have, there was one, one, there, there was this student, um, soccer player and, and for, and, and for, um, so for my class and it was the first year when it was, was still like we didn't have a very clear outcome of what we wanted for the class but again he tied his soccer interest and he created a tournament a soccer tournament with his friends or some friends from class his classmates and it was like he they invited some of the groups they knew but then they also invited some of the youth groups I knew from when I worked as the before the school I worked in government so they created this tournament and and that was very empowering and then and again, I think it's a lot of factors going in. But after that experience, he then was the community outreach coordinate, student coordinator at the time. And at the same time, as the, he for the creativity of product design, he started painting tennis shoes. Like the Adidas shoes were, were very popular back then. So he started painting them and he started selling them. I remember I bought some for my kids for Christmas or something. And then... Um, he graduated, he went to SCAD. Um, he actually played soccer there too. And I, I felt said. SCAD, yes. Yeah. Okay. And I think he studied international uh, uh industrial design, something along those lines. But um, as I followed him in, in LinkedIn, uh, well in Instagram first, and he started um sharing some shoes he was designing throughout college. And I think right now he works at Nike or Adidas or something like that. But again, I mean, all I think between the tournament and the community service and painting the tennis shoes was very unexpected. Like, I, I don't think he, I don't know, it would have been interesting to ask him like seven years ago, like, mm -hmm. was this what you envisioned? And I think it's all these opportunities, whether it's at school, whether it's at home, whether it's in the community, that start building sort of this portfolio or this, these experiences to support them. And again, I mean, the tennis shoes, for example, it doesn't have to do, you know, I'm more toward, my experience is more towards community service and outreach programs. Mm -hmm. But, but again, when we, and that's why I merge like what you can get paid for and what the world needs. If it's the same. Like if, if somebody needs it, they'll pay for it. And, and I think as he painted this, this tennis shoes, it was it people were willing to pay for them you know I had another student also that started tutoring her sister uh, he's in 11th grade right now and his sister is in sixth grade and she was struggling with math and she was tutoring her and he was trying to look for for something bigger than and I said I think just tutoring your sister is great I said if you want to go and scale it well you can you can offer your tutoring services for example in your sister's generation and I think right now he has about two <coughs> Students. he tutored for for what was left of, of this past school year so I think a passion project and I think a lot of people even adults we are very afraid of of the word passion because it's like you know we we find it that it's a very intense feeling but I think and I and I saw this from a from Jay Shetty from Think Like a Monk and I think he he has it very clear and and, and in order to get into a passion it it it's first a, it's an interest, but in order for an interest to turn into an interest, it first starts as a curiosity. Oh wow! So that for me was very powerful when I said it. And I I said I like we had students for these element projects, and it's like okay, so I want to study computer science, and it's like okay, so what can you do right now? And it's I don't know anything, so take an online course and learn Python or learn whatever. So so again, it's I think. The more students know about their interests and have developed skill sets, mm -hmm. the easier it will be for them to come up with a project. But it's it's a personal, like if, if we want to put it in simple terms, it's just a personal project. So you can do a painting, write a book, you know, like tutor your sister, but it's just something yours, very unique and very meaningful to you. Um, I had one student um, that wanted again to do their own thing and it's like, they heard me saying that that public schools lack English classes and computers and a lot of things. And when she came to me and she said, I want to develop an English program. 
like a second for, for second language. And I just looked at her and it's like, it's going to take your whole high school just to learn <laughs> how to teach English. And I was trying to tell her, yes, you can do it, uh -huh. but it's, it's going to take forever. And I think what students and teenagers need is to evidence the impacts of their actions. Mm -hmm. So I started swaying her uh, as we explored her, 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 again, her interest and skill sets. Um, she said she was good at coaching soccer and she liked soccer. So I said, the difference between teaching English is that it's going to take you five to six hours a week to research for several years to come up with a program. And I said, if I give you a ball and I put you with a group of girls or boys in a field, you'll start training because you just sort of copy your own training, the, the training you received. So I think it's also helping because then you have all these students that want to do like change the world, you know, like mm -hmm. save the polar bears and it's helping them a sack of mold. Bring it to reality and, and something that's quick because the sooner they can see the impacts of their actions, then the more confidence they have, they, they like, they, 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 that will help them pursue and continue um, the project and they really enjoy it and it's not burdensome and, and, and then it starts like segwaying from their actual skill set. I think that's really wise advice because, and that's again, one of the role that you play as an advisor or we play as adults working with students is to help them scale it. They do, they have, and the Gen Z especially is very, you know, I want to say the world, very conscientious about these things, but let's bring it down to a biteable. Let's not eat the whole elephant at once. What can you take a bite off and then, you know, go from there. So I see that as, as a very wise thing. I also love that you've included that third element of what does the world need? Um, I think that's a crucial part of it as well, because we can have a passion for, you know, certain things students can, but if it's not something that the world needs or cares about, then then that's going to be, um, you know, not be as fulfilling or, you know, you might lead to just a futility of effort. So I think that's an important part. So yes. what's next, Gabby? What, what, where do you want to take this? You know, you've been developing this and working with students, you've seen the results of this. What do you see as the next step or stage? Um, well, I, I actually, you know, it's, it's been a process for me. I think it also took me some time. I think there was a lot of my personal journey was I, I studied architecture, um, then worked in the family business and, and let myself certain self limiting beliefs turn me, um, come away from this element or this like passion. Um, so I think what I really would like to do is find um, or offer services or, or find a program because unfortunately the character, the character education program was canceled because they brought in a new advisory program. Um, so I, I actually would like to, from all this learning again, and, and, and I think I'm, I'm rewinding a little bit. I think one of the biggest, you talked about unexpected outcomes. And I think one of the biggest unexpected outcomes that I saw in, in my school community was when we started doing the community outreach program two years ago, I was working with a very small group of students that wanted to help. So we started like we had the mu this this girls with a music program and we started scaling it. We we replicated the model and started teaching chess and dance and basketball. And then we had the food bank volunteer. And then my office started to become like this working hub and people just went there and sat and listened, you know, and exciting. And then it's like, at least I also want to do something. And it's like, OK, because sometimes they were wingmen, but some people like I really want to do something. And there was one student that came in, a senior around October. Like I miss, I'm missing a hundred hours and I need to graduate by June. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> okay. And I don't want to be a volunteer. I want to do my own thing. So as we started like, um, like having a conversation. I started sharing like, this is where we're at. These are some of my super dream activities that I would like to do. One of, our, one of the things that I've talked with the students was we wanted to take the dance students to see the Nutcracker in, in Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, just as that, 
was as part of as an extra element for the volunteer program. So I shared with that he left. Two days later, he's like, Miss, I already got tickets. How many tickets do you want? Y yo, mm, 80. Okay. So he, he had a, a good contact with a venue that hosted the Nutcracker. So in December, we took the 80 students, plus the volunteers, plus the teachers. Super exciting. He was there. Again, he saw the impact, saw how everyone is really engaged in it. Then he got tickets for Stomp for the music oh, wow. students. So he got this contact. Um, and he actually, after he graduated last year, like two, two Junes ago, and I think he took some some the, some kids from the or, the local orphanage to watch. I think it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like or Lion King. I don't I remember which Broadway show came here. Um, but what was most interesting is a junior student that also had spending a hundred hours. He said, "Miss, I want to be like him next year." So, so what I did notice is. The more students you have mm -hmm. pursuing this meaningful work but I, and, and actually being true to themselves, which I think in any, I think in any part of the world, like adolescence is all about peer pressure and trying to fit in. I think it it's like a positive peer pressure. It's like this revolution where people actually want to also start doing something. So going back to your question, I think what I want to do is I want to was create this platform or create this program or something <laughs> where I can actually support you in our community and maybe even internationally to start making this movement of, of, of purposeful teens. I think uh, now with the Anxious Generation book coming up and everyone really stressed about teens, I think it was William Damon from Stanford that said that we don't have like a stress problem in teens, but it's more like it's a mean, it's, it's, they're meaningless or per, like without purpose. So they're missing purpose. So I think um, more, and again, they're consequential outcomes. This girl that did the music program ended up in Yale, I think with a wow. pretty good scholarship. So, so those are consequential, I think, but I think what I would really like to do is come in power this next generation of humans uh, um, to tackle the challenges and problems we lift <laughs> for them. <laughs> so if somebody wants to learn a little bit more about how to do this or have students that they want to have someone working with, you're available that they can contact. Yes, I would love to. Love it, love it. Well, we'll put that information in um, make that available and look forward to hearing in the future what things you're able to do and how things um, blossom and expand because I know they're going to. So thank you, Gabriella. This has just been so delightful. Um, I know I've got a lot of people's head spinnings at this moment. <laughs> but thank you a lot for inviting me and for pushing me out of my comfort zone because <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that the invitation to this interview also got my head spinning and said, like, maybe I do have something big to offer to the world. You do. You do. Absolutely. Thank you.